Dinosaurs. Plesiosaurs. Pterosaurs. All these amazing prehistoric animals and more are featured in the wonderful, spectacular new Apple TV series, Prehistoric Planet. And these creatures' names come from Latin and Ancient Greek. We're going to talk about all of them today. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. Prehistoric Planet's first episode starts with one of the most famous and popular of all dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex. This name comes from Tyrannos, which is ancient Greek for a tyrant, or also for simply an absolute ruler for a king. So in ancient Greek, it has a sense that's neutral, of just a ruler, as well as a negative sense, especially for the democratic Athenians. And added to this, Juranos, is the suffix saurus, and this is added to a lot of ancient animal names, because in ancient Greek the word saufra means a lizard. So this is a tyrant lizard, that's what the name suggests. And the rex is Latin for king. The way this is organized, as it is for every single animal and living thing on the planet, is an identified genus and species. Conventionally, the genus is italicized with a capital letter, and the species is italicized with a lowercase letter. The next animal we see is a mosasaur. So mosasaur comes from mosa. This is the Latin name for the Meuse River, which is a river in northern Europe. It flows from France and through Belgium and the Netherlands. Then we get to see pterosaurs. And here is an excellent time to talk about the difference between dinosaurs and other non-dinosaur reptiles from the ancient past. Here, for example, a type of pterosaur. Generally, we can say that the distinction between dinosaurs and pterosaurs and mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, which we'll talk about more soon, is that these classifications of ancient animals are parallel to each other. They're not all the same thing. The most general description we can give them is that they're all ancient and, for the most part, extinct forms of reptiles. Generally, I think that's a little bit more confusing because dinosaurs and pterosaurs and plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, while they have a lot in common with some living reptiles, they're also extremely different. And birds are directly descended from dinosaurs. They are, in fact, a type of dinosaur. So the dinosaurs themselves are not extinct. To clarify the distinction, we usually say non-avian, non-descended from the original prototype of bird dinosaurs are the ones that are extinct, while, obviously, the birds still live on and they are descended from one type of dinosaur. And they are, in fact, cladistically a type of dinosaur. In any case, it's very important not to confuse pterosaurs with dinosaurs, or plesiosaurs with dinosaurs, or mosasaurs with dinosaurs. Our popular imagination thinks of, oh yeah, they're all dinosaurs, but that's not technically correct. Dinosaurs include animals such as the long-necked sauropods, the theropods like Velociraptor and T-Rex. Uh, however, pterosaurs, like like this one here, and like the ones in the show, pterosaurs are a lot like bats because they don't fly with feathers. They had a leathery skin which was attached between their, uh, their hind limbs and their forelimbs to create this amazing large wing. Some of them were actually very small, but some of them were enormous. Some of the largest things that ever lived that flew were in fact pterosaurs. The Greek name here, we have pteron, which is ancient Greek for a feather, and then by metonymy, also a wing. So they didn't have feathers in the sense that birds have feathers, but they had wings, leathery wings, or wings that were based essentially on skin rather than feathers. Here is a tethy draco, and this comes from the combination of draco, which is a dragon, with this other word tethus, which is ancient Greek for the titan tethys. This was the counterpart of Oceanos, the ocean. So the titan of the ocean and the titan 
of the, the sea, if you will. So Tethys refers specifically in geology to a sea which existed between continents, the remnant of which we could say is the Mediterranean today. So this is either the dragon of the Tethys Sea or the dragon of Tethys herself. There's also the enormous Phosphato or Phosphato Draco, Phosphato Draco. So this is named after phosphate deposits where the animal was discovered, fossilized remains of the animal were discovered. Phosphate is named after the element phosphorus and in there we have the Greek roots of phos, which is light, and phor, which is from the ancient Greek verb phero, which means I bear, I carry. The English word bear, to bear, to carry, that is cognate with phero, and also Latin phero. It's named that way because phosphorus can glow when exposed to oxygen. Another beautiful pterosaur that we see is the Alcyone elenus. Now this is named after the ancient Greek word Alcyone. Alcyone was a daughter of Aeolos, of Aeolus, the god of the winds, and she ends up killing herself by diving into the sea, whereupon she gets reborn as a kingfisher, which in ancient Greek is an Alcyon. So the Alcyon is the kingfisher. So this is something like uh, the kingfisher Elainus. Elainus, I've read, is described as wanderer, but really the only ancient Greek word I found that applies is related to the word for olive which is alaya. So it seems like olive wood would be a better adjective to go with this actual word. I'm not sure how they came up with wanderer because that's where the word planet comes from. That means wanderer. Here we see another plesiosaur, the Tuarangisaurus. Now, Tuarangi is a Maori word for ancient. So here we see that this animal, which was discovered in New Zealand, they decided to use a word which comes from that area, from a Maori language, instead of using a Latin or Greek root. And a little bit later in the video, I want to ask you what you think about this practice, about using non-ancient Greek and non-Latin roots in the classification of living things. Plesiosaurs we can think of in really simple terms as being parallel to dinosaurs and to pterosaurs and to mosasaurs. Plesiosaurs and mosasaurs were two kinds of ancient reptiles, which are now extinct, that lived in the time of the dinosaurs, but they weren't dinosaurs themselves. They had a different evolutionary path. The word plesiosaur is from the ancient Greek word plesios, which means near to or nearby. And I suppose the intended meaning is that they are nearly lizard-like, because they do kind of look like a lizard or a reptile in the modern sense. Of course, these were underwater living creatures. They breathe air a lot like dolphins or whales. In another video, I'm going to have to go into more detail about taxonomy, about how living things in general are classified, how we can classify them based on general characteristics and groups, which is sort of the traditional taxonomy. But cladistics, which is a more recent kind of descriptive system, is focused more on the evolutionary history. In any case, we can see that plesiosaurs are an order of animals or a clade, they're a type. And they swam in the water much like mosasaurs. So mosasaurs and plesiosaurs are two very successful groups of ancient reptiles that lived in the same time period as the dinosaurs. And that time period generally is called the Mesozoic, the middle life, the middle of the time period in which there is life is essentially what that means. The Tuarangisaurus is part of a family called Elasmosaurs or Elasmosauridae. And Elasmos or Elasma in ancient Greek, this is a piece of metal that's been beaten flat and refers to the flatness of the tail. One of my favorite parts of the episode is when we get to see ammonites. Imagine here to be doing a kind of beautiful mating dance. And their name is actually not a modern Neo-Latin term, but is an ancient one given to them by Pliny the Elder. And Pliny the Elder called these Ammonis Cornua, which means the horns of Ammon, because the ancient Egyptian god Ammon was often depicted with ram's horns. I also love the part in which we get to see pycnodont fish. Pycnodont has two roots. There's odous, which is ancient Greek for tooth, and buknos is tightly packed. So it would seem to refer to the tightly packed teeth in the mouth of this animal. The pycnodont fish here is seen cleaning the teeth of a Mosasaurus hoffmanni, Hoffman's mosasaur. 
There's one more Mosasaur in this first episode, and that's the Kai Kai Vilu. So Kai Kai Filu or Kai Kai Vilu, this is a name from the Machupe language. And in that language, there's actually no contrast between voiced and voiceless consonants. So sometimes it's written with a V, and sometimes it's written with an F. It's standardized in the taxonomy as Kai Kai Filu. I think their plan for this first episode was especially good because they give the Tyrannosaurus rex an actual dinosaur and not a non-dinosaur, ancient reptile, the very first scene. People are expecting to see dinosaurs, and they do. But all of the other animals in this episode are not dinosaurs, but very interesting and very important prehistoric animals, like plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, and pterosaurs. That's a great way to educate the public about the diversity of the ancient past, while also giving them at least a little bit of what they want. If you want to see Latin language dubs of the series Prehistoric Planet, check out my other channel, Scorpio Martianus. So now I want to ask you, what do you think about having names like Mosasaurus Hoffmanni, Hoffman's Mosasaur? That's the genus and species of that animal. Whereas a lot of these other names actually have some really cool descriptive characteristics in them, in the Latin and ancient Greek roots. My personal preference, loving Latin and ancient Greek, is, well, we have these Latin and ancient Greek names. Do we really need to use terms from other languages? Obviously, this is something that cannot and should not be reversed because these scientific names are made and that's, that's it. And trying to change them or reverse them, make them all Latin and Greek, would be absurd, especially when there are millions of species that are cataloged. Such is the beautiful diversity of life on this planet and in the past. I especially like the Latin and ancient Greek ones when there's an attempt to describe something about the assumed behavior or about their physical characteristics especially because then it's something that's always true about it and helps me at least remember one animal is like another or different from another because of certain characteristics that are actually in the name. It's another reason why I love terms in organic chemistry because they tell you exactly how much uh, stuff is going on, how many carbons and things like that. And even the names of minerals in geology or something like phosphorus. It's called phosphorus because it gives off light and phosphates have phosphorus in them. So I like that about the taxonomy in biology most of the time, and also in a lot of other scientific terms. And this is why it's so useful to learn Latin and ancient Greek, because with those languages, having that vocabulary, it gives an immediate access to the intended meaning. Taxonomists in the past were quite fluent, at least in reading and writing of Latin and ancient Greek, so it made sense that science would carry on that tradition. Today, though, as Latin and Greek studies have become less popular, especially for very prominent scientists, except for the convenience of being able to access the taxonomy to do scientific work, there's no actual need to know Latin and ancient Greek. It's not like it gives you a forma mentis that makes you better at science. That's a bunch of nonsense. One can be a scientist without knowing any other foreign language at all. So it seems completely reasonable that scientists should specialize and you know do science really well. But at the same time, man, if you know Latin and ancient Greek and you try to do medicine or science or you name it, where there is a lot of taxonomy, a lot of naming conventions that have come from Latin and ancient Greek over centuries of tradition, it makes it so much easier to remember these terms because the words we have from Latin and ancient Greek and medicine and science are not going anywhere. They're going to be a part of not only English, but many world languages for a long time. So it becomes incredibly utilitarian, very valuable, very useful to learn Latin and ancient Greek just to have better and faster access. At least that's how I see it. If you studied these things, what do you think about that? Love to hear from you in the comments. And if you like this show, which is called Prehistoric Planet, let me know what your favorite episode was. Really appreciate you watching, sharing, and subscribing. Walete.